So yeah, I'm, I'm John Brandt and for about 25 years now I've been building tools to refactor code or migrate code, transform code. Um, I started out building uh, tools in Smalltalk for re refactoring Smalltalk, then I went to migrating Smalltalk using the same tools, and now I migrate pretty much any code to other code. So there's many ways to migrate code, and I have, this is kind of my strategy. So first thing, you have to define the parser for whatever language you're gonna migrate from. Um, a lot of times, we already have the parser, but sometimes you don't. So you find the parser. The next thing is you create your transformation program. That's gonna basically run and convert all your code to the, the new, new language. And one of the final things is we, a lot of times we'll have to have a compatibility layer because there's features in the old language that aren't available in the new language and we'll need to support those. Now, SMAC itself just handles the first two. The compatibility layer is all up to you, um, but SMAC can help you both on the first two. And the good thing about this migration strategy is that essentially the developers can continue their normal development using the old system. We, so it re really reduces risk as long as you know, they they can develop, I can go in and define the rules, do all that work, and so you're not stopping development. If I fail, all it is is, you know, I, I didn't, you know, I, they can still use the old system. Um, the bad, bad part about this, and the reason why most people don't like these migrations is it keeps the same design. So if you had a, you know, a poor program before, you'll still have a poor program after. Um, this strategy works fairly well for probably 100,000 line programs and up. Anything smaller than that, you're probably getting into overhead that you might just rewrite it by hand or use some other method. Uh, most of the projects I've done have been in the range of one million lines. I've done probably from 100,000 up to six million or so. so. So SMAC itself um, is basically just a standard parser generator, kind of like long lines of Yak or Bison or something like that. It's an LR parser generator, an LR1 parser generator. It supports the uh, GLR or the, the generalized LR so it can do a ambiguous grammars. Um, it can also generate ASTs and it does some pattern matching. So here, here's a basic grammar for a simple expression. You know, um, I guess it's just a um, just simple addition where you can have number plus a number, you can put parentheses around it. Now all the code, if you remove out all the underlying code, that's just a, the grammar for that. The underlying code is for defining the AST. So you can see like um, the first thing is the that um, percent root expression, essentially that, that defines the root of the hierarchy for your AST nodes. Suffix is basically uh, the suffix we're gonna put on all the nodes, so then, then in each one of those we can define a variable. So if we have on the, the first line an expression or the first production an expression, it says we're gonna have for that addition expression that we'll have a left variable that has, holds the left expression, the operator variable which will hold the operator token which will be just the plus, then we'll have the right variable which will hold the right expression and we'll create a binary node for that. Similarly like the, the second line we have our left paren and right paren, however we do not name the expression in that line, in that case SMAC will um, figure out that what you're really wanting to do is add the left print and right print to whatever that expression returned. And since it sees that the type of that node is gonna be an expression, it can actually figure out that what you want is uh, a collection of variables with the left prints, a multiple, or a collection of left prints and a collection of right prints on each expression node. So from that grammar, we generate essentially these three classes. 
um, with expression node being the root. We have our left parens being a collection of parentheses, or a collection of parentheses tokens, right parens being a collection of the right parentheses tokens, and all nodes will have that. Our binary node will have our left and right with the operator, and the number node will have the value. Now, the transformation program is really where all the work really takes place in the project, because there's where you're writing your rules to convert everything. And for the SMAC, it has basically a set of rules. It's uh, or not a set more. It's an ordered list of rules. You can apply it in order, and you can define some methods and properties that you can use for the in those rules. Um, so there, there are essentially two different types of the rules. There is the declarative pattern rules, and there is the imperative coding rules. Imperative coding rules basically gives you small talk. You can write whatever you want. It doesn't even have to do anything per the migration. You can write stuff that loads files or whatever. It just lets you do about anything. Generally, those type of rules we, we use for generic or general syntax. So if you're converting a method or a, a class, this is the one that will convert all the syntax for the method or class a lot of times in those imperative rules. And, and they can also do some control flow, so if you want to process one section of the, the AST before another section of the AST, that's what they handled. Now the pattern rules, a lot of times we use those for things that are one-off, so you're in the middle of a file, and you notice this one expression needs to be treated differently than every place else you've had that expression. There might be something special in the context, so you can write a pattern rule just for that one location, and the good thing about those are they're fairly quick to write because they look exactly like the code, and you can transform them that way. So in the pattern rules, essentially the, the search expression is just a, a, a normal text string like you would have in a, in, from your program, except that you have these patterned, patterns in the middle of them. And on the search part, it's, it gets parsed into an AST. On the replace side, the whole pattern is just a string that gets macro expanded. In order to support pattern matching in our parser, we have to define first that it needs to be a GLR parser, because what we do is every place you have the pattern in there, we have to parse all possible um, all possible trees with that pattern in there. So the pattern could, on our example here, the pattern could match a, a binary node maybe, or a pattern could match a number node. We might have to parse you know, all possible interpretations of that. So we need the GLR parser. We also need the pattern token. Since you know, various languages have different grammars, you know, we need to have something that's um, that does not conflict with the existing grammar. So um, I know most languages don't, do not use a back, quit or back quote, and so that's what we normally use. So here we have a pattern token is going to be a back quote followed by anything that's not a back quote ended with a back quote. Um, there's languages like JavaScript now that's using back quotes, so you might have to do something different for those type of languages, and that allows you to specify all you want. So using that, we can write then expressions like the one you see there where you have A plus A, or the pattern variable A plus the pattern variable A is going to be rewritten by whatever the pattern variable was, A, times 2. And basically that pattern variable can match any AST node. So it can match a single number, it can match a a, a binary expression. So here's our example, or an example. We have original code of 3 plus 3, and we're going to search for the pattern A plus A. So what we do is we parse both of those. So on the, the left, we get the standard AST. And on the right, we get an AST, but with the pattern variables in there. So we have the anything node in there. and well, we run unification across that, and we get the pattern variable A equals 3. 
Now, if we had three plus four, we'd run unification, unification would fail, and so it wouldn't match. Now, whenever we have replacement, replacement works a little bit differently. It's not, we don't parse the expression, we treat it as a string macro. Instead, what we do is whatever got matched, we just delete that and replace it with whatever that string macro expanded out to. Um, this, I think this works fairly well whenever you're converting from one language to another. Otherwise, you, you'd end up with two different parse trees from two different languages trying, or in the same tree, essentially, or two different um, parse nodes from different languages. So that's the reason why on the rewrite, we don't write rewrite trees, we re, 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 rewrite with strings. So essentially take the string, delete it, uh, take the replacement macro, with the, or the pattern macro, um, put in the, um, whenever we have the, the pattern variable in there, we'll ex we process that, that subtree and whatever it returns, we put that in the macro and replace that. So in our example, we had the replacement we wanted of the pattern variable A times two, and we matched with the pattern variable A equal three, so replace everything with three times two. So here's a couple of examples from some migration, uh, some Delphi code that we did. The first one um, is one of these kind of uh, one-off expressions you, you go through and you start to migrate the code and you notice that, oh, some places they use this uh, for loop, which the ending condition was minus one. The normal for loop um, rewrite would have been less than or equal to C minus one, but we could change that to be less than and make the code a little, little bit nicer. So that's the type of one-off expressions that we'll, we'll do in the pattern matching to make the code a little bit nicer whenever it's converted. The second one is actually some code that in, in .NET, you're not able to set the, um, the minimum size or the minimum height of a window by itself. You have to set the minimum size, which includes the height and the width. So what we do is whenever on, on that um, A slash forms T custom form, what that's essentially saying is we're gonna match some, something we'll call it A but it has to be of type T custom form. So if, if you're doing it from some other thing, it's not gonna um, match. So the type of whatever A is has to be a T custom form. Um, so then the code rules. So code rules in SMAC are essentially just any small talk expression. Um, for the, the, the search part, what we do is we have an AST node that must match then some code that, that returns, if it returns true, then the, the, it's gonna match. The replacement are generally um, either in three different forms. So they're like edit expressions, so you can edit the, edit the, the methods, or edit the source code. Um, control flow, where you tell it which nodes to do, or just generic small talk code where you can load files, do whatever you want. Um, edit expressions. So we tried to make it so that um, create a language so that it looked more like what you would think of whenever you're describing what you're wanting to do. So you do things like self replace some node with some text um, for replacing. You know, um, if you want to move one node before another, you can do self move this node before another node. So we try to make it um, like, like what you would think if you were editing the, what you would tell somebody to do if they were sitting down at an editor. Um, same with inserting, deleting. Um, control flow. Normally, the way SMAC handles stuff is it goes, starts it from the root of the tree and processes down until it finds a match. And on these code rules, once it finds a match, unless you tell it to do something, it's gonna stop right there. Um, we can change that by telling it to either, you know, you can process the children of this node, you can continue on processing this node, so if some other later rule matches the same node, 
um, you can process whatever. So, like if you wanted to process the tree bottom up instead, all you'd have to do is write a rule that said self process children, self continue. And that would change from a top down to a bottom up traversal. So, here's a couple of examples of those type of matches. First one's from Delphi, where we just take a statement block, has a begin and end, and we do replace the begin with a Opening, or opening curly bracket, replace the end with the ending curly bracket, and we continue to process the, the rest of that tree. Uh, the second one's from some power builder migration where we migrated to C sharp, and they have these function objects. And in the function object, we, we, we need to check whether we, we check the type, the type node, but um, the type nodes can be any, any type of um, power builder type. So we also need to check whether it equals function object. So, and whenever we do that, we set a couple of properties. Then we just uh, replace the whole match with uh, a partial beginning of a partial class. So that's pretty much it for the type of rules that we can we can do do in SMAC. Um, one of the things I have done though is to add some custom tools in there. So here's um, for a custom debugger that we have for debugging uh, grammars. So if you debug your parser, um, one of the things, you know, if you have a table generated parser, a lot of things are just like numbers in your table. So it's really hard to debug. Um, what, what we do is um, we store off kind of the the meaning of those tables or the, the, the integers and give it symbolic names. So here we, we have our parsing some JavaScript code and in the top left we have our stack of what's being parsed. So at the bottom level we're parsing, the, you got the module list, then we have the var token and then some the variable declarations and the comma right before that. So we're, we're right at parsing, let's see if I can read that there. I can't, too, too small. But we're, we're parsing what's selected there in the, the bottom or in the middle. And that we have, that's our look ahead. So in the top, top right here, we have essentially all our, our possible actions for that look ahead or for that state that we're currently in. And so we can, if you could read, the, it's going to match this identifier and it's going to be a shift action. So the next thing we're going to do is shift that identifier. A lot of times what will happen is if you have a parser error, you can open up the debugger and you can see immediately, oh, we have this type of token and there's no action for that token and that's the error. So you can see immediately of, you should, you should have had an action so you might have missed a semicolon or whatever earlier on. So. That's the type of stuff we're going to look for. And the GLR is, will just list all the states. And so if it's doing uh, multiple parses in the, the grammar, we can see that it's actually ambiguous grammar, so we have multiple different paths through there. So we have the section here which shows the input that we're parsing. You can actually select some place in the middle of the input and do step the cursor and it won't parse to that location. Um, the scanner state is here. Um, normally, unless you're, uh, um, it will always display like the scope, so um, the SMAC parsers can have multiple scopes that they're scanning in. Um, and if you're in the middle of scanning it, it shows some more detail. But And the bottom's the standard debugger information that you would see. Um, normally, it's not that Interesting. So when we match, we also have preview support. So you run, run a rule, say preview, and it'll bring up two different windows like this, or two, you know, two different views with the input on the left and your resulting code on the right. What you can do is put your cursor anywhere in there. You can select some stuff. So here what I did was like put the cursor like in here and when, when I do that, it tells me which rules change that piece of code. 
And if then if you select a rule, it will then highlight the sections on the right of every little piece of change. So here, I selected here for this, and it told me this event, event declaration node rule changed that text. It put in, put in that, that, this piece, added a semicolon there, and added the ending parenthesis. On the left, it just highlights the node that actually matched. Now from this, I could actually uh, tell it to go to the rule directly from here. I can also tell it to bring up the debugger. So I have a rule debugger, which has essentially the stack of the rules up there on the top left, the rule that's being executed. We have the original code and the ending code. And we can step through there. We can also scroll down here and run the cursor or whatever. This down here is just some inspector stuff. But. So with all these tools, it makes it a lot easier to get to where where you need to be for finding out um, who changed this and why you know when when it's not performing correctly. So with that, I'll open it up for questions. Yes. When you parse the patterns, you mentioned you had to have a GLR parser to parse them. Um, how do you, so do you have a way of like starting the parser such that it's not necessarily looking for the start rule of the grammar, it's looking for Yeah, because basically the, so the, the, what he's asking is that um, how do I start from any place in the grammar and because you, you can't just start from the start node because these patterns can, you know, be any node down below. And the way I do it is start from all of them. And most of them will fail, you know, immediately because they won't be able to shift what you're looking for. And the patterns are fairly small. You know, it's milliseconds, essentially, to... Any, Yes. Um, how do you resolve conflicts between uh, overlapping patterns? So how do I re resolve conflicts between the overlapping patterns? Um, what I do is actually take all the possible patterns. So I, I will, so, you know, if this, this expression, this pattern expression can potentially be, you know, five different subtrees, I'll try them all for matching. Any other questions? Okay.